UNFTR. Anti-Semitism is not an eternal hatred, plaguing humanity since time immemorial. It's not a virus, a plague, or some other natural phenomenon. It's not merely a private prejudice of the heart, not merely a symptom of extremism at the fringes, disconnected from broader political structures of the world we live in. Rather, anti-Semitism is a political project that reinforces structural inequalities in our white, Christian hegemonic society and protects the most powerful. So that's from the introduction to the book, Safety Through Solidarity a radical guide to fighting anti-Semitism. And it's written by Ben Lorber, a senior research analyst at Political Research Associates, and Shane Burley, who is the author of several books on the far right and a frequent contributor to UNFTR favorite, The Baffler, in these times, Daily Beast, and other publications. So with that, I'd like to welcome our guests today. We've got Ben Lorber and Shane Burley. Welcome to the program. So we have a ton to get into, but um, why don't we just start with the basics here and uh, maybe one of you can just take the the question of why you decided to write the book, when you actually started writing the book, and sharing kind of the central thesis about it. Why don't I take that to you, Ben, since you, you're the one that had the idea in the first place. Sure, Yeah. So Shane and I started talking about this in, um, yeah, I think, early 2020. Um, and, you know, I think like, like many American Jews and like, like many Americans, we saw the rise of anti-Semitism um, under the presidency of Trump and the rise of the alt-right and the MAGA movement. Um, and we also saw the rise of these um, accusations of anti-Semitism that we thought were often pretty frivolous that were directed against for example, supporters of justice in Israel, Palestine, or progressive movements like the Women's March. Um, and we knew we needed a different conversation about anti Semitism. We knew we needed a progressive conversation. Like, we are both progressives and we wanted our fellow progressives to understand what it was and to take it on. Um, you know, and there were, were a lot of books out there at the time that really did not offer this progressive perspective. And so we decided. Hey, there's a gap to fill, um, and we can fill it. Yeah, and I think, like, you know, kind of coming up in the radical left, this is not something that tends to be talked about. <laughs> Maybe the only thing that's not talked about endlessly, in a way. Um, but there are pockets of it. There's little histories. Anti-fascist movies tend to talk about it because they deal with white nationalism. Um, histories of Jewish feminism, the Jewish left have talked about it. There's been sort of, like, pockets of the Marxist left that have talked about it. So we wanted to sort of like look and bring that stuff together and bring it to a contemporary conversation to see like how we can start to like bring that conversation back in a way that's actually confronting the underlying issues, but also like bringing the lessons we've learned over the last 20, 30 years about how do you build a social movement? How does power actually work? What does it build a bit mean to build partnerships with other people? That kind of thing. So Actually, Ben, I was hoping that you could um, share a story that you recount in the book because I found it, I found it a really powerful story. So it's in the beginning of, I think it's chapter nine, the chapter titled Looking at Anti-Semitism and Israel-Palestine, because in it you share this anecdote about participating in a BDS movement for Palestinian rights. And I found that this story kind of perfectly encapsulated how anti-Semitic sentiments can kind of hide in plain sight in coded language that many non-Jews simply can't hear and don't even see, even when they have the best of intentions. And I thought that was a, a really good framework for us to have this discussion. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the story I tell is that, um, yeah, I was, um, you know, um, at a conference that was uh, a very supportive of, of Palestinian you know, rights and, and freedom, um, as are both of us and as are many American Jews and many people in this country and around the world obviously um you know and the speaker was talking about what we call deadly exchanges between uh police forces in the u.s and israel right so these are times when when um u.s cops might go to israel um, and get trained in various crowd control and kind of terrorism and other tactics and these are very real training. This is a very real thing that happened. It's not a conspiracy theory. 
and and movements like Black Lives Matter have looked at these trainings and said, hey, we can draw powerful you know, linkages uh, between the oppression that we face uh, um, as Black Americans by police uh, violence and the oppression that Palestinians face. So that was all well and good until all of a sudden the um, the person at the front of the room started saying, you know, um, you know every police um, officer um, on a college campus is trained by Israel. Um, and by the way, yeah, yeah, in a Zionist uh, capitalism, um, under underdeveloped um, Africa, and any time that you see um, the words um, internationally accredited on a, uh, um, on a police car, that means that cop was trained by Israel. Basically, they started saying all these conspiracy theories about how you know Israel was kind of like the hidden hand behind um, all matter of you know, phenomena. They even said that like Martin Luther King was potentially murdered. So beginning to criticize um, Israel in 1967. So basically, um, it was an example of the way that really real and you know um, valid critique of Israel can sometimes shade over um, into anti-Semitism. You know, you know, and I have to say that you know most uh, critique of Israel is completely valid. Your supporters of BDS, and your supporters of justice in Palestine. It's really important to say that because often, as I said. These accusations can sometimes be levied against uh, BDS supporters in a way that's very um, unjust. But it's also important, as you said, to be mindful of these times when anti-Semitism can show up and to know uh, what it sounds like and how to combat it. Uh, Shane, can you talk about the idea of how people are maybe sort of comfortable in anti-Zionist rhetoric under the notion of punching up? I found that a really interesting way that you that you threaded that that narrative throughout the book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talk about anti-Semitism in general as a sort of form of punching up. So, for example, like lots of bigoted theories are actually about how different groups of people behave in subhuman ways. Maybe they are as smart or maybe they bring in bad practices or they're morally bankrupt in some way. And while that plays to a degree in narratives about Jews, there's also the narrative that they're actually controlling things. And that actually, tar, you know, anti-Semitic theories in a way are a way in which someone can kind of punch up against the powerful, punch up against capitalist class, punch against inequality and global imperialism, things like that. When it comes to anti-Zionist rhetoric, there is a version of it. And then, then again, like like Ben was saying, this isn't like the main line kind of critique of Israel. Um, and often this is more likely to be found on the far right but that sees sort of Zionism as a code word for Jewish cabal and in control of all nefarious systems. You know, and the way we talk about this in the book is that Zionism and the problems of Zionism really just stem from Western colonialism, and Western imperialism, basically Western power and inequality itself, right? It's sort of an extension of that. And that's a very logical, structural way to kind of think about it. It's when you see it in such exceptional terms that it like moves away from reality. And at that point ends up being sort of a way of validating those underlying assumptions that there's something about this group of people that's uniquely problematic, that has uniquely powerful. And of course, that's separated from like what we normally think of as a, like a positive critique of capitalism in the state. OK, so we're, we're already having an incredibly rational discussion about irrationality and problematic issues and and language. And a lot of the work that we do on this program is to talk about language and to dissect it and make sure that we get it right. Uh, because language truly does matter in these discussions. Um, and I think that's one of the other big things that I appreciated about the book is that you really dissect the etymology of words, but also the, the ideas and the meanings behind it and how those ideas present differently in different parts of the world. And on that note, one of the things that I find really interesting is that I find it easier to have rational discussions about Israel-Palestine with my Israeli friends than I do with my American Jewish friends and family. So can you kind of speak to the the disconnect between maybe American Jewry and Jews from other part of the world in terms of what Israel, the place that Israel holds in people's hearts and minds? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think, I don't know. You know, today um, and throughout history, uh, different different Jews have had a lot of different ideas about Israel. Um, I know that you know in my family there can be a disconnect that happens. I almost sometimes I agree with you. I can sometimes um, experience how, for example, uh, in my family, uh, most of my family isn't 
instinctually as supportive um, of Israel um, and whatever it does and has been for a long time, even though they've never they've never been to Israel. But you know, for them as American Jews, um, Israel is kind of a, a symbol of Jewish safety or, or Jewish pride. Um, you know, after the Holocaust, right? The Jews need a home to be safe. And I can really empathize with that. Um, at the same time, they often aren't that really aware of dynamics in Israel. They aren't really uh, aware of things like, like the occupation or of, of you know, other problems with the Palestinians that, that have been like very real. Um, and, and growing up as an American you know, you know, Jew like myself and, and Shane and many of our generation, um, once we kind of learned about um, Israel's occupation, we often have been very, you know, outraged and very determined to do what we can to change it. And actually, I talk with Israeli Jews um, on the ground who are under you know, no illusions that, that Israel is actually a very complicated, you know, place with a lot of deep issues that have to be resolved. It's not simply some, you know, a, you know, a fantasy in the mind as I often encounter among American Jews, but it's a real place with real people real um, Jews um, and Palestinians who need to work it out and find a just and lasting peace, that's often going to be very grounding for me. Um, Shane, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, one thing I think that's an element about Zionism in the American context is that it just has a rich emotional life detached from actual politics to a degree. Um, and to a degree, it's also mixed up with what sort of the land of Israel means in a religious context, which then sort of like floods those kind of that emotional reality together. So oftentimes I'll have conversations with people whereby a criticism of Israel, even a foundational criticism, flies until it talks about Zionism as an idea. Then it becomes kind of over the line for them. Or when they're having to confront, like, what are the actual implications of a, a demographic majority that's sort of built into the state of Israel and how that violates every notion they have of liberal democracy in their own home. Right. And like, so all those sorts of things become like kind of obvious as a problem, yet the attachment runs so deep. And so I think it's just, it's so deep in the narrative, both of Jewish safety, also of Jewish continuity and future, Jewish connection to the land. All those things end up playing sort of like a sub rational role in people's lives. And then also as a founding narrative of what it means to be a post Holocaust series of generations, right? And how this comes through, you know, three years after the conclusion of World War II, there's all these elements that feel just so emotionally powerful for folks that I think it makes it next to it impossible to look at just some of the realities of what's happening in Israel-Palestine that in any other political context, people would kind of throw their hands up. And I think with Israelis, and I don't want to overstate it with Israelis, if you see them polling about the war and things like that, <laughs> there's a shocking level of support for violence in a lot of cases, you know, and obviously people like living in, in settlements and stuff at like just rapidly increasing rates. But at least they're dealing with sort of like a reality of this is actually a government I live in, people vote here, people argue over things. It's a much different relationship, I think, when you get to the U.S. where people's emotional attachments are just so locked in, like way past their rational politics. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've done we've done extensive work on the show, kind of mapping the history of Palestine and the Jewish diaspora and the and how the so-called facts on the ground of the 20th century writ large led to the current political crisis. Because We wanted to make sure that we did it like a proper historical analysis from everything from the roots of, of uh, the socialist roots of the Zionist movement all the way through kind of the the blended societies that already existed, the safe harbor that many Jews in Europe al had already found among in the Ottoman Empire and among the Muslim people. Um, and so we we tried to do the work to lay out the the as much of the groundwork as possible. And one of my biggest takeaways from doing that is and kind of bridging the gap to the how we talk about the conflict here is that, Jewish Americans can offer an honest critique of the of domestic authoritarianism. They have no problem criticizing Trump and they don't like what they see here, uh, but they're sort of blinded by the same instincts that are present in the Knesset and among Israeli leadership. And I've often said that, and I, and, and I really want an honest reaction from you about how you feel, if you think this is too hyperbolic or not, but I've, uh, in, in conversation with people that I, that I dearly love that are very charged about the current political crisis and the war in Palestine, is that I, I, I will say to them that the, I feel like the greatest threat to Jews around the world is from the extremist fringe groups like Otsmaya Hudit. 
in Israel and the far right of the Likud party and what that represents from the political apparatchik in Israel. So, but that doesn't, that's that's some tough medicine to try and, and if you don't have the historical context and i'm wondering how you how you respond to that and how you feel about that sentiment because i'm genuinely worried i feel their 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 frustration and their and their genuine fear about what happens next are we going are are jews throughout the world going to be uh, is there going to be no safe harbor left for Jews around the world? It's a very, very rational, real fear that they have. But my feeling is that it's the actual leadership of Israel that is presenting the biggest threat to that safety. But I, I don't know how you feel about that and how, how you might respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of reasons why that can be true. I mean, on the one hand, I think it's important to note that a, a far right government, far right parties need friends in other countries, right, to build alliances. And what they're doing is building their alliances with anti Semitic far right parties, right? So they're literally basically sort of pumping up the global far right that's specifically dangerous to Jews in the diaspora. Not something that the Zionist right has never done before, right? Like this is actually sort of like part of the project and its self conception to a degree. I think also, like you're saying, Israel is becoming an, an increasingly sort of unsafe place for Jews. Like when I look at Israel, I don't think to myself, what a tremendously safe place for Jews, right? right? Like this is not somewhere where I feel like Jewish safety is taken seriously. You know, me as a person who has a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father, as the Israeli far right takes over, am I welcome? Do they consider me Jewish in those spaces? Like, I, could I go there and get married, for example? No, but, you know, like there's all these reasons why they're actually cutting out large portions of Jews. There's a joke a friend made once where Israel is the only place where there's specifically laws that disenfranchise reform Jews, you know, like, so like the majority of Jews, right. In, in the U S like kind of don't track with that model of religiosity that's built to the rabbit in Israel. So there's all those reasons why I think like this becomes a problem. And again, like you're saying, if we're talking about an Israeli far right, that I think actually goes back decades in the structures of Israel, right. There's a certain inevitability to why the far right's taken over now. This is an incredibly volatile, violent movement that does not look like my Judaism or my Jewish community or my Jewish history. It's really unfamiliar to me. Mm. And so in that way, I think it's an assault on sort of our traditions and identity. And it sort of like hijacks what those things are and redefines them in ways that I find kind of frightening. So I, I, I do agree with what you're saying there. And that, that I think the question ends up being, like, what does that mean for Jews in the diaspora and our relationship to that? Does that mean the severing of those relationships? Does it mean joining movements to push back on it? Because uh, increasingly, uh, like, it's hard to even see continuity between, like, myself and my Jewish community and what's going on in the Knesset and, like, those communities that call themselves sort of like a, a global agent of to the Jewish people and yet engage in ways that are just completely unfamiliar to me. Yeah. And the last piece that I want to add to that um, is one really concrete way that the Israeli far right um, um, is helping to, uh, to drive um, anti Semitism is, you know, studies have shown that uh, over the last couple of decades, whenever there is um, an Israeli attack on Gaza that has a large number of casualties, I know that, you know, that correlates to an uptick of other anti Semitism against Jews um, in the diaspora. And I want to be clear that. I'm not saying that you know, Israel causes of anti Semitism. Right. It doesn't, right? You know, anti Semitism is already here. It's baked into our society. But nonetheless, you, 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 you can't avoid that um, you, those actions are harming the image of Jews around the world. Um, and it's also not to let um, anti Semites you know, off the hook, right? If you, you know, living in you know, England um, or New York um, or wherever, are mad about what Israel is doing in, um, in Gaza, and you decide to go up to um, a synagogue and spray paint something on the wall, if that's on you, that's anti-Semitism. You're, you're targeting you know, Jews uh, you know, you know, based on your anger at Israel. You know, that's conflating um, Israel um, and Jews um, all around the world. But Israel does, by the way. The Israeli right does that too, but nonetheless. But my point is that you know, Israel's attacks um, on Gaza don't make Jews any safer around the world. I think that's something that's hard to talk about, but it's essential for us to to confront. And it's one more reason that, that I think uh, Jews everywhere should have a, a stake in and call for an immediate uh, ceasefire and really calling for radical changes in Israel that end this 
the status quo of occupation and violence. So what I really appreciate in the book, how you lean into difficult conversations like these. Um, and frankly, I find them just invisible in certainly in mainstream culture. And I don't have high expectations of the type of discussions that will be had on mainstream media. Uh, but even in some progressive circles, these difficult conversations aren't really happening with great honesty. And, and one of the areas that you lean into is this idea of, of Jewish whiteness and sort of dispelling some myths around it, bringing in some, um, you know, cultural histories and really trying to, un to, to unpack and understand what that means. So we did an episode a while back on the fracture of the so-called grand alliance between Jewish and black social justice movements in the 60s. Um, and, you know, Cornell West, for example, citing the fact that uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, Martin Luther King, W.E.B. Du Bois, these were all Zionists and that very much aligned with the with the Zionist project and and having safe harbor uh, because of, of what was happening in their historical times that they could witness and see. And there was a great alliance between uh, these two these two factions. Uh, but the fracture that began in the 60s around the Six Day War and the black liberation solidarity with the Palestinian people kind of shifted this narrative to what we have today, which is a really difficult, talk about difficult conversations. Um, and so the narrative that changed in the sixties was this idea of Jewish whiteness and how uh, the Jewish Americans, because of their whiteness, were able to lean into the economic progress in the post-World War II era and sort of left behind the black culture and the black alliance that had that had formed around the civil rights movement. And that tension is expressed today in really difficult and troubling ways. Again, without that historical context of this alliance was once real and now it's not. And we have some repairing to do. Um, and one of the ways that you talked about it that I thought was a really helpful framework is is talking about the issue of, of, of whiteness, the difference between Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazi, Mizrahi Jews, and the concepts that Jewish people themselves have to confront in talking about whiteness in this society, but then also realizing, hey, 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 it we're, we're everywhere and our experiences are different throughout the world. So can you kind of bring us into the conversations that are happening among American Jews and, and the different factions that you that you speak to yeah. throughout this book and the different movements? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really complicated um, uh, question. And I think, you know, one thing that often gets lost in the way that this conversation is is set up in the mainstream is that um, the existence of, of Black Jews and Jews of color are totally invisibilized. Or when people imagine that it's just some uh, some clash in between the Jewish community uh, on, on one side and the African-American community um, on the other, you know, Black Jews uh, live in both worlds, and they often, you know, uh, face racism and, um, and white supremacy within uh, white Jewish communities, um, and they also face um, anti-Semitism within Black non-Jewish communities. And I think, you know, uh, uh, I've been really um, inspired by uh, the leadership of of, uh, of Black Jews um, and Jewish progressive you know, movements who are really, really craft, you know, crafting a different narrative of uh, yes, there, there, there is a vision right between white Jewish and black non-Jewish communities, but but also this potential for coalition and for for alignment. Um, and I think the other thing that I often hear from from some of my black Jewish friends is that the notion that, that there was you know ever the, this perfect unity uh, between um, between Jewish and black communities um, um, in the civil rights era, uh, it's also um, a myth, right? Like we like to, it's almost like a story we tell um, ourselves to, like, to make us you know, feel good. Like, sure, the, there were rabbis like um, Abraham Joshua Heschel who marked with Dr. Martin Luther King, but you know, I, and the majority almost of American of Jewish communities really were not that active. Some were, I, 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 some stayed quiet, you know, for fears of anti-Semitism. A few, especially um, in the South, were maybe even supportive of Jim Crow, or or at least you know did not oppose. And you know, like many, um, like many folks uh, today who stood on the sidelines, a lot of Jews stood on the sidelines. And so I think it's really, really in inspiring to see to talk about the, the alliances that were there and that could be there and that are there today because. The reality is also that American Jews have played 
large roles in social justice struggles and continue to. There's a long history of Jewish left um, activism. But it's also important that not to tell like an overly rosy story about it. Um, and Shane, I wonder, there's a lot to add here. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you look at the literature, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, particularly from Jewish leaders um, of mainline Jewish organizations, not the Jewish left, but there was a very intentional effort of being like assimilating to what we would now call whiteness, wanting to be considered white, wanting to have protections of that, wanting to not be seen as immigrant outsiders. Remember, many of these people were just kept um, out of immigrating at a real at, in the middle of the Holocaust and things like that. So people actually wanted to say, like, no, we're just like normal Americans. And I think that's a, in a way that's a driving story of the assimilation project of like American immigration and other communities. Jews are not the only one. And, but this ends up being the project of, you know, large scale Jewish organizations that want the sort of moderate centrist participating in American democracy form of Jewish safety, as opposed to the kind of Bundist or radical left or communist party version of Jewish safety, which is about transforming the kind of underlying conditions of society. So you have groups like the Anti-Defamation League or American Jewish Committee that were specifically about creating this kind of centrist, participating in politics, participating with law enforcement way of developing Jewish safety. And that's in direct contrast to a lot of black freedom struggles, which were about looking at the underlying system. And that spreads over time as people move from cities to suburbs to a certain economic um, stability and are able to kind of rest on those laurels where like those pressing questions maybe weren't as pressing as the generations went on. And what you see now with the development of the Jewish left or radical Jewish communities, or even a, a kind of Jewish tradition that that's bringing Jewish ritual practice back into the forefront or like kind of investing in Jewish kind of uh, ancestral practices more. It's a kind of disassimilation or people challenging this idea that just being part of the fabric of the American project is really what brings us fulfillment and safety instead, like, you know, actually having alliances with other communities and like looking at own ancestral traditions, that being a really important part. And so I think that like we're talking a little bit about that shift, which I think is real, you know, and there's, there's books written about the conservatization of the kind of the Jewish electorate. But that being said, you do have a history on the left. We would be lying if we said that wasn't true. And the reason often comes because, one, we come from a tradition that teaches liberation. It talks about what it means to be liberated from oppression. And two, because we've been there and we have those stories and we have those kind of lessons to, to build on. So if if you're not having these conversations frequently and you're just sort of like dipping into issues around anti-Semitism or Jewishness and Israel Palestine and you're just you're just sort of awash in in mainstream media talking points and not kind of practiced with the language one of the things that must seem really really bizarre is this this strange alliance between the far right in the United States and uh, the support of Israel right now. Um, but you guys do an amazing job in the book talking about the connective tissue there and making sure that people understand this isn't really what it seems and the support is really maybe not from the, the emotional or uh, scripture place that you might want it to be. Um, mm -hmm. But can you talk about this, this, uh, strange alliance, these strange bedfellows between the far right in the United States and uh, in support of uh, Jewish occupation in Israel. Yeah, and I, you know, the, the joke we had when writing the book is that if there's an Israel lobby in the U.S., it's a Christian Zionist lobby, right? <laughs> like it's actually evangelicals that are overwhelmingly going to be driving the politics on this, which is what's so interesting when we get back to whether or not the Israeli right is actually doing anything for Jewish safety. If they're building their support with Christian nationalists who in the diaspora pass legislation that disenfranchise Jews, how great is that for Jewish safety, right? And that is where the overwhelming U.S. support comes from. And this ends up being this sort of uh, devil's bargain where we're looking at folks uh, in Jewish organizations see protection of Israel as the ultimate kind of vessel for Jewish safety then why not partner with the Republican Party and like the pro-Israel right, despite what they say? So, and obviously Christian evangelicals don't suddenly have this, didn't just change their mind 70 years ago and decided they really, really love Jews. And that's what this was going to be about. It was specifically about an eschatology that sees sort of Jews returning to what they see as ancestral homeland and then participating in sort of an end times scenario where Jews are either killed 
or forced to convert, which is another way of saying forced to stop being Jews. And that's so, the part that re- most people just stop right before that piece, right? And, and that right. never really kind of gets out there. Yeah, and, I think, and this, it, at the same time, too, I think we have this politic whereby the right, the U.S., and, and also in particular in Europe, where Islamophobia has become such an important part of that. And if they can see Israel as a proxy for fighting the Islamic world, however they have framed that, that's also sort of an opportunity for that. And in a way, actually, Israel does actually become a politics of whiteness for them. It's sort of like a European outpost. And look at them protest- protecting Western civilization. So it ends up taking all those proxies. And while there is a sort of like Israel critical form of the right, usually on the far right that sees that, we're talking about two flip side positions on Israel, both of which motivated by something that can be clearly called anti-Semitism. So when we're seeing the Republican Party right. that have this quote unquote diversity of opinion, but also like pushing uh, Jewish speakers up there, why are they doing that? What is their underlying feelings about Jews? Do they actually want a pluralistic society, which is historically what keeps Jews safe, right? Having a society that respects people's difference and creates like community between them, that's what keeps Jews safe. That's specifically what's not on offer from the right. right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like awesome. the absurdity of this is really highlighted, you know, um, during the recent you know, Gaza Solidarity Encampments on U.S. campuses, you had people like Marjorie Lee Taylor Greene, who one moment said, oh, these encampments are anti-Semitic, and the next moment, these encampments are funded by George Soros, right? So they're, <laughs> they're using this, these anti-Semitism, real, real conspiracy theories, and this accusation of anti-Semitism in this, the same way, right, to demonize progressives. Um, and to harm our movements. And I think that's what makes you know, so many conversations around um, anti-Semitism um, in the mainstream so um, infuriating. And it's not only uh, like Marjorie Taylor Greene and the crazies on the right, it's also um, institutional leaders like, like Jonathan Greenblatt uh, of the Anti-Defamation League. Um, mainstream leaders of the American Jewish community are really colluding with the, the far right to, to try to pass a range of legislation that could really restrict free speech and First Amendment rights. That could even be used to to shut down a justice and organizations under ridiculous uh, yeah. you know, charges that they're supporting terrorism. So this is really a, a crisis and an attack on on free speech and our First Amendment. And no matter um, who wins um, in November, um, it's a uh, it's a lasting threat. And I'd I'd love to say that it's you know only the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, but it's it's really disturbing the way that uh, the Democratic leaders, I also have to say Joe Biden, you know, who says uh, without Israel, there's not like a single Jew um, in the world who is safe. He's basically saying, as the leader of this country, I can't guarantee Jews safety. Jews need some ethno state on the other side of the world. So it's, you know, this uh, this mentality is very deeply baked in and it, it doesn't make Jews safer and, uh, and it's a threat to our democracy as well. Do you think it's because um, people like you just go around flaunting your space lasers that it's it's more jealousy <laughs> than anything else? Is this where this is coming from? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, um, yeah. I was working on, on the latest space laser. I had that thought. Like, maybe they're just jealous. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's kind of obnoxious, yeah. to, be, to be truthful. Um, yeah. I do want to talk about safety and security and and the, the concept of that um, before we go. But... Um, let, let's lean into it like, uh, again, another difficult concept for people because of the singular, what I feel is kind of the singular space that the Jewish people occupy throughout history of being a culture, a religion, a people, and now a nationality that's tied to an ethno state. Uh, the, the Jewish experience in the world is sort of singular in that respect. And you can look all throughout history to see that the when when there are difficult economic circumstances and scapegoating is a way to make these these experiences more palatable to the power structures and to the elites then the the jewish people are, are often put upon as the scapegoats and the people that have to leave so i mean this is this is historical and one of the questions that you see come up most of the time in any sort of discussion in the mainstream media is well, do you defend the right of Israel to exist and then to defend itself? And it it leads to some really, if you are not studied in this area, it leads to some really tricky conversations with a lot of trapdoors in it. But I do want to talk about this idea 
of safety, security, solidarity, but also through, not just through, I would say, emotional and intellectual solidarity, but having a state, the right to have a state. The socialist roots of the first Aliyah and then the necessity of the, let's say, the second and the third Aliyah also in, in that time period because of what was happening in Eastern Europe and with the, the Pale of Settlement, there was emergency, there was economic reasons to do it, there was also so momentum behind socialist movements and all of these underlying reasons to find a homeland and to not just take over a homeland, but to assimilate. There's lots of research on both sides that, you know, there, there's there's both sidesism with that argument as well. But let's just take it for at face value that this was a place in the world where Jews had found safe harbor throughout history, um, at different times throughout history, and at that moment in time felt it was the, the safest place to be. And then the identity that grew up around that of a place of our own for the first time ever. Personally, as a progressive and also not a Jewish person, I find that story really compelling and really important. And I do not want Israel to not be an ethno state. And that is, that's an irreconcilable opinion for some progressives, right? Uh, but also it's, it's born out of a practicality and a, and a historical experience. So when you're presented with this idea and that question, and people say, well, do you even believe that Israel has a right to exist as an ethno state? How do you respond to that in a way that meets people where they are, but also expresses a genuine solidarity? Yeah, this is a, a really deep question. You know, I mean, I, um, I've i had like, you know, years of conversations, uh, sometimes arguments with people like, like my grandma, for example, um, who was born in 1929 and who's you know, very progressive. I went to Paul Robeson concerts. Um, yeah, I was a socialist in the 1940s and 50s. And um, until McCarthyism kind of, uh, you know, made her want to hide that, right? Um, and I say to her sometimes, you know, um, she's also very pro Israel for the reasons you, know, you described. And I say to her, like, if I had stood where you stand, um, I probably, you know, and had known what you had known, I probably also would have marched with you up for the creation of Israel um, in 1948. I can't say that I wouldn't have done that, right? And I have a lot of empathy for the historical um, and present day realities of anti Semitism. And I guess. You know, when people talk about should Israel have a right to um, exist, I say, look, like what I hear in that question is something I share very deeply. I want Jews um, in Israel to be safe, to be thriving, to have full you know, autonomy, to have full you know, expression uh, as religious, a uh, cultural um, expression. So, yeah, um, there's a Jewish civilization there. That's not going anywhere. I don't want that to go anywhere. For me, the question is what laws and policies are just um, and will lead to actual peace that will keep Jews safe. And for me, the projects of having laws and policies that enshrine a permanent demographic and majority of Jews in that land, um, on a land where Palestinians were expelled um, and, and still have an identity, still want to come home, still want to thrive and flourish. I don't think that's going to keep Jews safe, and I also don't think it's just. I, I don't think it's a lasting strategy for Jewish safety to have apartheid there. I don't think it's a lasting strategy to keep um, millions of Palestinians in refugee camps um, in the Middle East. You know, I think like in the news and the headlines every day, we see that this the status quo cannot work. So for me, it's less about does it have the right to exist? And more, what's the future that we want to see? What laws and policies? And for me, I think, you know, laws of equality um, are, are basically the only way to, to basically um, make sure we don't have a future of, of bloodshed for the next, you know, for Peter, uh, uh, many more years. Um, Shane, what do you think? Yeah, I, mean, I don't think it does us any favors to, like, deny people's historical and emotional reality about, like, what these things have meant, right? Um, but I think we also need to like sort of look at the realities of what has taken place and do something about them for the future. You know, so for example, like you talk about the socialist influences in the kind of early Aliyah, 
But, you know, a socialism that's not internationalism, that doesn't kind of reach across lines of difference, doesn't really live up to that name. So when you create, you know, kids would seem that then kicks off, you know, um, uh, farmers that have been there for generations and refuses to kind of hire them because of eager labor policies, that ends up not really being a socialist move, right? It's a socialism of a particular nation, which yeah. is exactly the kind of model that I don't think keeps minorities safe. Um, I don't think that a state whereby there are specific policies to prevent Palestinian land ownership or where there's an occupation where like Palestinians literally can't drive on certain roads and have to have different license plates. I don't think that is sort of ever tenable. So the question about an ethno state is I think that time in history should be put into the past. But that is, doesn't mean that Jewish safety has been put in the past or Jewish connection to the land or Jewish communities. Right. And so, like, my hope is that a political range, and again, Ben and I don't live there, right? Our vote doesn't count there in a way, right? Like, people who are there work out those solutions. But one that honors everyone's sort of right to live there and to work towards what would it look like to have Jewish life be thriving next to Palestinian life that's thriving and have equal sort of, like, reputation and voice for everyone there. And people often will come back and say, like, yeah, it sounds really nice, but look at the history. How is that going to work out? And my answer to that is, yeah, look at the history. How is this working out? Uh, <laughs> I don't think that this is going to keep going. And as, for example, conversations now move, not just from settlements, but to annexation, to multiplying them, the carving up a potential Palestinian state, it's almost questionable where this two-state idea will even rest into the future. And instead, we need to think about, like, what does it look like to put Israel-Palestine into the global movement of people trying to say, like, hey, how do we have an international society where people are collaborating, where difference is respected, but on a horizontal framework? And I actually think that honors the, Je the Jewish history in the land. And that may be, in a two degree, the only way that you honor the Jewish history in the land. Um. One thing I wanted to get to, um, let me see where I wrote this down. Oh, you did, again, another thing you guys did a great job with in the book is um, training us to hear the dog whistles. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a couple definitions in here that I, I never really actually put two and two together and that I thought you did a great job. So you could, things like blood libel, I think are it, it's pretty obvious and historical and, 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 and you I find them mostly used in extreme circles, but there's other words and um, and and anecdotes that people use that definitely have anti-Semitic meaning behind them. That I think many of us just it just sort of goes over our head. So if you could just talk about a couple of these, like globalists, cultural Marxism, and then talk about the importance of the protocols of the elders of Zion. And I'll be totally honest with all of the work that I've done on this and, and the books that I've read and, and trying to really do my homework on it. The elders of Zion was something that sort of sat out here as conspiratorial and I didn't really have any connection to it and I never bothered to even research it. And then when you unpacked it in the book, I was like, damn, this people really need to know where, where the history of these words and these concepts come from. So those three specifically, if you could just talk about globalists, cultural Marxism, and the importance of the protocols of the elder of Zion and go. Sure. I, so, so the protocols are sort of a, a near turn of the century forgery from the Russian czar, basically a way of like channeling class anger away from the czar and onto a Jewish cabal. This, and like you mentioned, and we talk about throughout the book, this has been a common pattern throughout history and why we use the term like structural anti-Semitism, because those kinds of populist conspiracy theories return over time and they often take up the sort of cultural memes that people associate with Jews. But they essentially is a, a forged, quote unquote, record of a meeting of Jews where they plot out the destruction of the West, right? What is significant about this, not just that it motivated most kind of like anti-Semitic movements in the 20th century and actually in the 21st century, and that it's deeply inlaid in the logic of white nationalism, and other anti-Semitic movements, but that it was then used as the foundations for other conspiratorial works, some of which were more coded. Um, up to and including like, like the work you see in Infowars and other places like that really have their foundations there. And even a large portion of the Christian right still bases a lot of these, their kind of visions of the new world order or global power on these sort of foundations that are found in books like the Protocols and others. So it ends up being really important. Cultural Marxism is specifically based on a sort of theory that what we kind of call the Frankfurt School or critical theory that a bunch of Jewish Marxist academics basically made their way to the US and then subverted all the kind of standard issue 
uh, values of Western white Gentile society. You know, they they brought in you know, all kinds of decadent ideas like feminism and queer rights and, and and racial equality, and basically subverted our natural instincts, not our natural instincts, Gentiles' natural instincts at self preservation. And that now all these kind of social liberalisms are actually the result of this very intentional prodding from Jewish voices. And this comes from openly white nationalist sources that have then over time sort of been coded and reduced and they've taken out explicit references to Jews a lot of times. And now cultural Marxism is one of the most spoken rhetorics on the right. It has returned over and over again. And then globalists ends up being another version of this. It's sort of like, you know, cosmopolitan elites, other things that have historically been used for Jews, these are supposedly urban, rootless uh, group of people. They're actually pulling the strings and specifically undermining national identity, which, of course, they think is so important. For what, what's so interesting, though, Shane, is like you'll hear a Ben Shapiro figure talk about mm -hmm. cultural Marxism, and then you'll hear like an Alex Jones be like, oh, it's the globalists. Yeah. But he's staunchly yeah, in it. defense of Israel. And then so there's head fakes in there that really confuses the the rhetoric. And I think a lot of the times the people will go and repeat those tropes without even realizing where it comes from. And then and then the damage is done. It's just oh, yeah. like I had not thought about globalists in that term, in the in the idea that we're re what we're really referring to are people without a country. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and it was like when you just laid it out in black and white, I was like, oh, oh, that's fucked up. It's just crazy. That's yeah. where that comes from. So anyway. Yeah, and, no. Yeah, yeah. And it's a core, you know, like you're saying, you know, people like Ben Shapiro, um, they might genuinely you know, believe that what they're saying is not anti-Semitic. They might say, oh, there um, are globalists of, of all creeds and colors and races. Um, and the, uh, on, one uh, on, on one level, you know, they're correct. I don't think that the, like every right winger who says the word globalist as thinking Jews in their heart. Um, and there's even, um, there are even left-wingers um, who use the term globalist. You know, that's that's the title of a book by um, by um, an influential leftist thinker. But I think the point is that the right, you know, the the nationalist right for over a century, um, ever since the protocols and even earlier, has thought in these terms. They have to say, we have a bounded, rooted national community, rooted in blood and soil. We are a people. And our enemy is this you know, transnational um, elite cabal that's undermining everything. And that way of thinking just uh, uh, just is core to the right wing um, ideology. And it ends up in a lot of directions, uh, cashing out um, in the direction of Jews. But in the 20th century, that just got very deeply uh, you know, laid in. And so you know, today, you hear people like Charlie Kirk of Turning Point in the USA once in a while, his mask slips and he says, oh, by the way, most of these cultural Marxists um, are Jewish, right? So it's this, you know, you, um, you see this, you know, you know tending towards explicit anti-Semitism, even if it's not always uh, there, you know? So uh, before we go, um, on, a, on, a, on a, again, on a personal level, I have a... Uh, uh, Jewish family members with Canadian roots who are in the process of renewing their Canadian passports. Um, very, very dear friends of ours who are also looking to Canada, but also other parts of the world um, to retire to, to leave the United States. Um, and they're pushing up those plans to get out of here sooner than later because they really feel unsafe. And we can have these conversations of is is it actual physical security or is it emotional security that you're talking about? Do you see examples of anti-Semitism or you just have a sense of it? And again, I would really encourage anybody interested in this to go through and read the book because you spend a lot of time talking about, okay, is this a clear and present threat to your physical safety? What expressions of it are you seeing? Or do you just have this sense that something's bubbling up? Well, I think the sense really is palpable and you certainly tap into that. And now I'm actually seeing the manifestation of it, of people that I love that are like, no, 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 we're leaving because we know Trump's going to win this second term. So can you, I don't even want you to like dispel that or like, talk, like talk about the very real threats that you, that you see and how quickly this may turn like really just kind of unearth what are your fears about 
more authoritarianism intersecting yeah. with anti-Semitism that's uh, kind of endemic to the country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I go back and forth. I mean, I definitely think yeah, yeah. anti-Semitism is rising. I have the same fears of, of, of it bubbling up. Um, I also often want to caution against the idea that like every rise in anti-Semitism is necessarily going to end in like another Holocaust. I, I think that's often a um, a narrative that gets, you know, there's a lot of trauma under that narrative. The narrative you know, has been taught to me from Hebrew school. Um, but I also think there's a lot of ways that anti-Semitism can be on the rise and there can be increasing threats to Jews, but it's not necessarily that we have to leave right now because um, in six months, the the storm to the knocking um, at our door. Um, I don't think that's that's true. Uh, but, you know, um, in the long range, I worry about that. Um, in some form and maybe like 30 or 40 years, that's a different conversation. But I think, you know, I'm also very afraid of, of there being no social security when I want to retire. I'm afraid of being, you know, never being able to retire. I'm afraid of not having um, health care. I'm afraid of not having jobs. I'm afraid of, of, of my political rights being, being taken away, not only as a Jew, but as a leftist. I, you know, I'm, I, I think, you know, the general uh, breakdown in, um, in democracy um, and the rise of authoritarianism threatens all of us um, as human beings. And if I were going to you know, try to leave the country, I, I, I don't think I want to. I think I want to uh, try to stay and fight to make it better. Um, this is where my family has lived for generations. right? But if I were going to leave, it would be less because I think that I'm going to be persecuted tomorrow as a Jew by Trump and more that like the country is just falling apart and becoming a really true place, an impossible place to live in and raise a family. But um, I see this both ends in a lot of ways. Um, Shane, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that th there's definitely a worry. I think, um, you know, a lot of the of what we talk about about sort of like violent anti-Semitism in the U.S. is from street violence, is from uh, you know the far right on the street not in power. Um, and even when the far right has been in power, I wouldn't say that there's been like as many like legislatively sort of backed assaults on Jews. But there are shifts happening in the sort of frontline GOP right that includes like some of the things Ben had re mentioned basically a return to more open anti-Semitism often in the form of Christian nationalism just being a much more upfront and kind of like volatile I think that can be threatening and I think that's something to definitely watch and sort of share Ben's thoughts on this I think it's really hard to keep an even keel response to these things um and but I also want to validate people's feelings. Feelings are real. Like things actually happen. And we have, for example, like organizations and narratives that talk us about what safety looks like and those things are being eroded. And so I think it's important to actually like consider like what does it mean to make kind of a culture safe? And I think you do that by building up organizations and social movements and relationships, both between Jews and non-Jews that can prioritize that safety. I actually think that's the, the, the real answer here. It's like, if we're looking around our neighborhoods, do you know your neighbors? Do you know the folks in the mosque who also might be targeted by white nationalists or might also be targeted by the Trump administration? Like, that's where I think in a lot of ways, the most kind of pressing or the most pressing model of safety is going to be. I also think that like, you know, and we talk about this quite a bit in the book, you know, anti-Semitism relates to other forms of oppression. It's also intersectional with those and it also depends on them. And so, for example, you know, if you're like a left wing organizer, left wing activist, unionist, anti-fascist, something like that, and you're Jewish, that those things end up playing out more volatilely with more volatility than they would otherwise. Right. So it's it, those things end up sort of like being like a multiplier in the situation. And anti-Semitism is also a lot of ways the intellectual scaffolding that helps to sustain attacks on trans health care because conspiracy theories are so important to that or attacks on abortion rights, right? Or mobilizing anti-Black assaults. You know, a lot of shooters, like when you have entered like kind of Black churches or Black neighborhoods, open fire on non-white communities, have, when you look in their manifestos, are filled with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. So these things are pressing in ways that I think go beyond just like kind of the immediate assessment of them. Um, and so we need to be very clear on that. But I do think in a way, the right trajectory towards a more open anti-Semitism, making it very, very clear, I think that is, in a way, the most pressing threat. And like Ben said, the, there's always these questions. Do you stay and fight? Do you go somewhere else? I think right now the model of escape people have or Jews have had is to go to Israel. And I do not think that that's actually the more safe place to be. And I think we need to have a more open-eyed vision of what it means to be safe to live a flourishing life. 
And I think the answers you get from that are different. But ultimately, no one is going to be safe anywhere unless we build a kind of multiracial democracy. We build communities that are actually vibrant and surviving, mutual aid networks to sustain you know, collapse and catastrophe, the things that could happen with economic and, and environmental decline. So all of those things together, I think, is a more three-dimensional view of what it means to, to create safety in your community. It sounds to me like you're suggesting that the real safety <laughs> is through solidarity. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, somebody decided to start a small engine outside of my uh, window in the city here. So, um, <laughs> but... Before we go, I just want to make sure that we hit on some of the the, the main points of, of what you really want people to know about, uh, you know, why they should pick up this book. So if, if there's anything we didn't cover or you just want to kind of have closing arguments, the, again, the floor is yours. Ben, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think I want to pick you back on what Shane just said. I think it's really important. Uh, it's something that we didn't get to enough is that, like, I think the core message um, in our book is that, you know, anti-Semitism is really tied into every other form of, of rising and injustice and, and oppression um, in our society. It's, you know, it's part and parcel of, of rising um, anti-Blackness, attacks on, on trans rights, rising anti-immigrant and xenophobia. And the way to fight it uh, is by Jews really linking up with all oppressed groups and and fighting for collective freedom and safety together. I think that's the number one message of our book. We aren't gonna be safe unless everyone is is safe. Um, uh, and I think that's a big, that's like you know, the polar opposite of the, the lesson that you know, Israeli nationalism might teach us, um, or the lesson that you know, we need to flee because only we are, are under assault that can teach us. And so I think, yeah, like Shane said, the more we can like, build solidarity um, at the community level, at the neighborhood level, uh, between communities. And also, I would argue to join, you know, broad-based national coalitions to save our multiracial democracy, to beat back authoritarianism, to, you know, in all the ways it's manifesting, to fight for economic justice, the labor unions, you know, anti-Semitism thrives um, in an unequal society where people are alienated and isolated and exploited. And the more we can trans transform those root causes of oppression, and build a better world, that's going to remove the core engine, if you will, for anti-Semitism. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, I think the intervention that we want to make. Um, Shane, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the, the goal of the book was to offer some people sort of like an authentic, like sincere uh, intervention on this question, which people are asking, and it's serious. And I think it's actually really a, a vital part of people's emotional life, their fears, and like what they're concerned about when it comes to the future but also are feeling sort of disenfranchised by the way this is talked about and what they're being offered as tools. Um, and so what we want to say is like, yes, these are actually issues we should be doing something about what has been done in the past. What could we do in the future that, that works a little bit differently than what, what's been offered now? And I think there's actually millions of people that are saying like, yeah, I want to take anti-Semitism seriously. And some of like the tools we've been offered from organizations or from the government or from, from police are simply not working or are, are, are sort of like harmful in other ways. And so I think like we are trying to chart that path out and we think that those things are possible. Like there actually is, there have been radical alternatives to this that have been really successful in the past and it's time to revive those. Shane Burley, Ben Lorber, Safety Through Solidarity, A Radical Guide to Fighting Anti-Semitism. Um, really well done. Gentlemen, great job. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It took me actually a couple of weeks to get through uh, because uh, after the first couple of chapters, I was like, all right, I, I want to take my time here. Great history, great uh, anecdotes that were that I think drew people in. So there's an expression of um, in, in the beginning of each chapter that really sort of connects anecdotally connects people to to what you're about to talk about. Mm -hmm. So. Um, just really well crafted, well constructed, and I'm appreciative of your time today. And thank you for writing the book. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. And I really appreciate being part of the conversation here. Yeah, thanks so much for your kind words and for having us, Max. All right, we'll talk again soon. <laughs>